Baker City School of Public Health. I'm Jessica Kant. I'm an MPH student and a member of the executive board of the Boston University Queer Alliance. Boston University School of Public Health is the eighth ranked school of public health in the world. It is a graduate institution that offers master's and doctoral degrees across the field of public health. The school's core purpose is think, teach, do for the health of all. We pride ourselves in excellence in research and practice, and we wear our social justice mission on our sleeve. I'm here with support from the school. USPH provides scholarships to 93% of students. I want to say thank you today for your support of students like me and so many others at the school. If you'd like to support more students for programming like this, please feel free to speak to one of our staff here today. This afternoon is my honor to introduce you to Dr. Sandro Galea, the de Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. Dr. Galea is a doctor and epidemiologist. He publishes regularly in the scientific literature and in national press outlets. His latest book, Teaching Public Health, was published, just published by Johns Hopkins Press last month. Without further ado, Dean Galea. Thank you, Jess, and uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Sandra Galea, as you heard. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. I hope everybody's had a great summer, and I'm delighted to welcome you to, the, to today's event. This is our first event of this academic year, and a particular warm welcome to our new students. We are truly happy to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Um, to everybody here, thank you for joining today's event. Events like today are, to my mind, at the heart of the community's ongoing conversation about how to create a healthier world. Today is part of our diversity and inclusion seminar series. Diversity and inclusion are central to our school's mission. Without a diverse range of voices, we cannot reach our full potential as a community. In a moment, you are going to hear from a voice of rare eloquence in that arena, that of Dr. Rafael Campo. We are truly excited for what he has to say. And I now am going to turn over the stage to Dr. Yvette Cozier. Dr. Cozier is our Assistant Dean for Diversity and Inclusion. Her work has been central to our efforts to place diversity and inclusion at the core of everything we do. Our SPH Read series would not be possible without Yvette's leadership. Thank you, Yvette, for what you do for the school. Yvette. Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Yvette Cozier. I'm an Associate Professor of Epidemiology and the Assistant Dean of Diversity and Inclusion at Boston University School of Public Health. This fall marks our fourth year of our One School, One Book program, SPH Reads, which is hosted by the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. The goal of this program is to encourage critical thought and discussion among all members of the USPH community and centered on carefully chosen, thought-provoking book. This year's selection, nominated by the school's Queer Alliance, is The Desire to Heal, a doctor's education in empathy, identity, and poetry by Raphael Campo. A memoir published in 1997, The Desire to Heal is a collection of essays exploring the author's Cuban-American identity, his coming to terms as a gay man and a physician during the emergence of the HIV-AIDS crisis in America, and his inescapable bond to the young patients, mostly brown-skinned gay men he and his colleagues could not keep from dying. <coughs> Dr. Campo is a physician and a poet. He is a pr primary care practitioner at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston and a professor, professor at the Harvard Medical School. He has published eight books of poetry and won several poetry awards. He is the editor and the poet of the Poetry and Medicine section of the Journal of the American Medical Association. I would also like to take this time to introduce this afternoon's moderator, Julia Lanham. Julia is the Assistant Director of Advising and Relationship Management in the Career Service Office at Boston University School of Public Health. She, is also, she also serves as the advisor to the BUSBH Queer Alliance. Julia has had over 20 years um, uh, in public health at the intersection of adolescent health, youth development, and anti-oppression work at Mass Department of Public Health, Fenway Health, and now at BU School of Public Health. Julia is an active advocate for racial equity in her Brookline community and a member of the board of directors of YW Boston. Th uh, thank you, and um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Campo to the podium right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Kozier and Dean Galea for uh, having me here, and also to Jess and the Queer Alliance for nominating my book. I'm, I'm really delighted to uh, be here at the Boston University School of Public Health uh, sharing my work, and uh, thank you all for coming. 
I'm going to warn you that I, I am going to read some poetry this afternoon, so uh, the exit is that way in case anyone panics, but please don't because uh, as I hope to show, poetry uh, really has a central role in the work of healing, uh, for me certainly, but I think it can for, for all of us. And um, I thought actually I'd start with a poem, and it's a poem I uh, often start uh, with in sharing my work, and, and it always makes me think a bit about uh, community. And, and, and when I think about uh, when I first contemplated a career in medicine, I, I thought I was a pretty unlikely candidate for success, and that had to do with my various identities. Uh, I remember thinking first about my faith, my spiritual life, and not seeing much of a spiritual life among physicians, I thought that might be a kind of challenge for me if I ever became a physician myself. And then, of course, was the fact of my ethnic identity and not having many Latino role models to inspire me uh, to a career in medicine. I thought that might be its own kind of uh, difficulty. And then, of course, is the fact that I'm gay and I'd experienced enough homophobia in doctor's offices at a pretty young age to make me wonder if, if that might be the biggest obstacle to the stream I started to have of, of being a physician someday myself. And as it turned out, when I finally arrived as a student at Harvard Medical School, it was the fact that I was the poet that was most problematic. <laughs> all these other identities, all these other concerns, you know, it certainly did, did pose some challenges for me, but, but being a poet really alarmed my colleagues and my, my peers. And uh, I like to tell that story, of course, with a sense of the irony in it, because I really cannot imagine the work of healing, as I was starting to say. Uh, without the presence of poetry in my life. And, and again, one of the things that poetry can do, I think, is call us into community and bring us together across many different kinds of identities, many different kinds of ways of knowing ourselves. So, so this first poem uh, is a poem that uh, I hope does that. And uh, I, I think of it really as, as a, a way also of, of locating myself in relation to some of these identities. Uh, that are, are central to my work as well. So, so this first poem is called Latinos. I read it earlier, apologies to those who've already heard it, but sometimes it's, it's helpful to hear a poem more than once, so. Latinos. Another avocado and I'm done. The guacamole I prepare is for the Super Bowl, a party for a game we watch because Americans love football. And after all, we want to be like them. A couple drops of hot sauce and I'm done. I spoon the guacamole into bowls. You say you love to watch football games. I say you're Puerto Rican and we're gay. So really, must we host this stupid party? A sprig of fresh cilantro and it's done. You taste the guacamole, then you smile, reminding me of why I married you. It's just a game, I think. Mi maricón, you say and pat me gently on the butt. The guacamole finally is done. You sure you aren't a little Mexican? This guacamole is delicioso. I tackle you onto the couch. We kiss a while, watch J-Lo in a Pepsi ad. I feed you chips with guacamole. Done with games, I ask you seriously, not in Spanish, but almost as grave. Is it too late to reconsider? Suddenly, you look delicious, like Lorca, surreal. I taste the guacamole on your tongue. The Super Bowl is just a game, you say. Miami versus San Francisco, sea to shining sea. We sing beneath the strobes and stars beside Americans like us. So now that I'm on the faculty at Harvard Medical School, I have uh, a role that uh, helps me think about the ways in which poetry, but literary writing and the humanities more generally uh, are important in, in healing and, and also in medical education. And I take this role very seriously because when I reflect back on my own medical training, as many of you uh, uh, saw in my, uh, my memoir, uh, I didn't really feel that uh, the humanities, that, that the humane even, was much present in, in my experience of, of medical school and, and 
further training. And so, so I, I want to you know, introduce the humanities in, in any way I can in, in the work I do with my medical students and, and residents. And, and one of the reasons I think it's, it's so important for us to think about uh, the arts and humanities is because they are entrees into empathy. They help us to see the world through the lens of uh, other people. And I wanted to read next an, another poem that uh, I hope enacts empathy in a way that, that shows uh, how it can uh, impact on, on work with patients in, in a clinical setting. And uh, this is a poem called Iatrogenic. It's uh, for medical people in the audience, you'll know what that, that term means. It's, uh, it's a condition that's caused by the medical treatment itself that we offer. And, uh, and so I thought it was appropriate to read as, again, a kind of an enactment of empathy. We talked about empathy a little bit earlier today uh, over lunch and at other times. And, and many of my colleagues say, well, you know, how do you even define empathy? Uh, but I, I think, you know, even though it may be hard to define, we can uh, perhaps model it more effectively than we do uh, in our work with our students and residents on the wards and other clinical settings. And, and again, I think this poem perhaps is a way of, of even enacting empathy. So, iatrogenic. You say, I do this to myself. Outside, my other patients wait. Maybe snow falls. We're all just waiting for our deaths to come. We're all just hoping it won't hurt too much. You say, it makes it seem less lonely here. I study them as if the deep red cuts were only wounds, as if they didn't hurt so much. The way you hold your upturned arms, the cuts seem aimed at your unshaven face. Outside, my other patients wait their turns. I run gloved fingertips along their course as if I could touch pain itself, as if by touching pain, I might alleviate my own despair. You say, it's snowing, Doc. The snow, instead of howling, soundlessly comes down. I think you think it's beautiful. I say, this isn't all about the snow, is it? The way you hold your upturned arms, I think about embracing you, but don't. I think we do this to ourselves. I think the falling snow explains itself to us, blinding, faceless, and so deeply wounding. So empathy is important in healing, I think, and, but it doesn't always come easily. I think really there are two kinds of empathy, and we talked about this a little bit over lunch and earlier uh, in the afternoon as well. Uh, there, there's a kind of emotional empathy, the kind of empathy that we feel uh, almost uh, reflexively for someone who resembles us, who perhaps in whom we see ourselves easily, and then there's the kind of empathy that's, that's more difficult, uh, uh, what, what we might think of as cognitive empathy, where, where we have to do some work to, to really uh, put ourselves in, in that other person's shoes, to really uh, try to see the world through, through the lens of their experiences, through their eyes. And uh, I thought I'd read next um, uh, an excerpt from one of the essays that it, that's part of my uh, memoir that uh, illustrates uh, some of the challenges around empathy. It's uh, from an essay called The Desire to Heal. When I met Aurora, she changed everything. At first, she did not speak at all, except with her huge, moist eyes. I had admitted her to the hospital at 2 a.m. one grueling on-call night with the emergency room diagnosis of AIDS failure to thrive. It was not until two weeks later that Aurora told me she was dying of love, of too much love. Cynically, I assumed she was referring to her own licentiousness. Aurora was a preoperative male to female transsexual, according to the terms of some of my colleagues. To others, she was a freak. My jittering and bubbling attending 
wondered with a nervous laugh on our formal rounds at her bedside the next morning what it had between its legs. Aurora just stared at him with her incredible eyes. I had written the order that she be placed in isolation because her chest x-ray was suspicious for tuberculosis. Consumption, she would murmur to me later. Yes, I believe I am being consumed by my having loved too deeply. I was too busy to notice then the campy melodrama in her tone of voice. I could barely breathe through my protective fiberglass mesh mask and thought only of getting out of her room as soon as possible. One day she began to flirt with me. I know you're in there, she purred into my ear one morning as I mechanically examined her. I paused only briefly before I plugged my ears with my stethoscope with the intention of listening to her heart sounds. Without saying anything, I raised her hospital gown up to her nipples, this time noticing the fullness of her breasts, the rich chocolate color of her nipples, the deep grooves between her delicate ribs. Do you think I am beautiful? She brought a crimson silk scarf up to her eyes and peered seductively over it at me. Her eyes were made up in three shades of green, the eyeliner and eye shadow thickly applied. I had seen her at her mirror only once, hands trembling slightly as she applied her cosmetics. At that moment, I had thought her beautiful, not at all pathetic or threatening or failure to thrive. She seemed hopeful and human, full of the love she kept so rapturously spilling out to those around her. But I was too busy to give much thought to what I had felt. My job was not to feel, but to palpate. Not to love, but to diagnose. During the course of about eight weeks, Aurora gradually deteriorated despite the intravenous fluids and antibiotics. Her cough became more insistent, as though it were finally winning a long, drawn-out argument. She appeared less frequently in her flowing emerald green kimono and stopped putting on her eye makeup. She gossiped less about the other patients and no longer held court in the patient lounge. I pretended not to see her. I still listened only to her heart sounds and not to her heart. You know you're gonna be mine, she sang out to me on another day in her naughtiest Spanish Harlem accent, parodying one of the day's popular dance club songs. I rolled my eyes as I left her room. I never said more than a few words to her on my visits. I busied myself instead with collecting the data of her decline, the falling weight, the diminishing oxygen saturation readings, the recurring fevers. I'm burning for you, honey, she said with arched eyebrows by way of goodbye on the last day that she spoke. Again, I said nothing. Expecting her usual chatter more than I ever could have admitted, I strode into her room the next morning without knocking, as was my habit. No salacious remark greeted me, however, no invitation to sit close to her on her bed, no perfume. The silence registered. She seemed to be lying sideways in her bed, with her face half buried in the pillow. The room's curtains had not been drawn open yet. She remained motionless as I jolted them apart, flooding the bed with sunlight. I glowered impatiently at her from her bedside. Still, she did not move. When I rolled her over, seeing her face stripped of all her glittery makeup, expressing not recognition, but a deeply subterraneous pain, a primitive and wordless agony. Finally, I was moved. As I groped for her, finding her body half paralyzed and oddly limp like a bird that's flown into a window pane, I began to feel broken myself. I was witnessing the loss of love from the world. Finally, in its absence, I was hearing her voice and when I frantically listened to her heart and to her lungs, for the first and last time, I heard love in them. I heard my own stifled desire surface for air in my long sobs. Aurora died later that day, but when she died, she left behind an element of herself in me. I find her voice in mine, like a lover's fingers running through my hair. My voice sounds warmer, more comfortable to me now. I discover her hands on my own body when I examine a person with cancer or AIDS, searching for the same human landmark that bespeaks physical longing and intimacy. 
Her glorious eyes return to me when I finally see someone for the first time or when my own bring forth tears. Her friendship and her love of life return to the world in these words, in the poems I write that I hope might ascend to reach her in whatever realm she may now exist. Instead of giving me AIDS as I had so irrationally feared, she gave me hope. Science failed to understand her, though it altered her body. Medicine did not love her, though it penetrated her with needles and x-rays. Only the act of writing can find her now, because it is the same journey she has made, from the imagined to the actual, from the transitory to the persistent, from the unspoken to this physical and loving lament. So I couldn't uh, visit such a fine school of public health without talking at least briefly about the prevention paradox. And um, I wanted to mention that just uh, briefly in relation to this next poem, which, which also explores some of the challenges around empathy and, and in particular uh, this notion of in groups and out groups and, and again how perhaps it may be easier for us to identify with someone in, in, in our in group, so to speak, or one of our in groups and, and how we tend to uh, keep distance uh, those, those in the out group, those uh, from a different tribe, so to speak. And, and I think that you know, perhaps informs some of the uh, issues uh, that come up when we think about the prevention uh, paradox. Who benefits from the, the screening that we, or the preventative uh, intervention that, that we want to offer? And, and, and when we target a certain population, uh, what are we doing when, when, we, when we even use the word target? Uh, are we stigmatizing in some sense? Uh, are we, are we uh, perhaps uh, posing a kind of question that without, without really engaging the person from the target uh, high risk uh, group, that's really uh, meaningful or, or useful uh, to that community, to, to them, to that person. So this is a, a, another poem actually that's uh, called Unexceptional, uh, Unexceptional that, that I think uh, perhaps explores some of these uh, questions in a, in a more poetic way. Unexceptional. Except we were in love, or so it seemed. The refugees kept streaming past. The cops kept shooting up the neighborhood. Except it seemed that we were happy, pulled the shades and set aside our textbooks, brushed our teeth. The honor killings went unpunished while we aged together, holding hands as we succumbed to sleep. It seemed that life was good except black mothers kept on dying young. We said our vows in church, and afterwards it seemed that queers were harmless, even mattered. The loved ones in our photographs gazed back at us, or at each other, or beyond, except the virus struck, the pipeline burst, the hurricane made landfall, killing thousands. We splurged on business class as if the wine at 30,000 feet could taste more sweet. Except that they worked hard, but since their son OD'd, it seemed that it was pointless now. The oligarchs kept stealing from the state. The politicians blamed the poor. Except the lamplight glowed. The music streamed as if the internet was limitless and magical as if we knew that anything for which we searched was certain to be found. We watched a baseball game on television, just like anybody else. It seemed like we were normal when the garden needed watering, while elsewhere, in the desert, someone was interrogated, beaten, kidnapped, raped. Except it didn't happen here, but there except it happened not to us, but them, except the sunset from our porch refused again to be the last, so damn beautiful. Oh, my.
my. I'm already running out of time. Um, I wanted to oh God, I wanted to read a brief excerpt from an essay uh, about going to college and belonging, uh, which is part of empathy also in a way. Uh, we all want to belong to to some group, to some community uh, that's also very human. And sometimes for for those of us uh, perhaps not uh, in in majority groups or in marginalized groups, uh, the group we want to belong to is 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 the one with with power, the one that uh, uh, somehow seems uh, better than than our group, and uh, and so this next poem is, uh, pardon me, this next uh, uh, excerpt from an essay uh, explores that a little bit uh, in a, I guess a humorous way, and uh, it, it does reflect back to when I, I first went off to to college, and and I remember looking at colleges with my parents, and and uh, of course my brothers tagged along, all packed into the family Buick, and. Uh, we visited a college in Western Massachusetts that many of you may know. It's called Amherst College, and uh, I immediately uh, decided this is the place for me. And I think something about those red bricks and the perfect quad, and uh, and maybe a little bit about the the kind of orderliness of the of the campus uh, really appealed to me. Um, and probably many of you don't know this, but Amherst, being Amherst College. Uh, calls itself the fairest college, and it is a very beautiful college, and you know, it has this quintessential quad in the middle of campus, and um, view of the mountains in the distance, and, and uh, my brothers, of course, when, when I declared that uh, Amherst was the place for me, immediately renamed it the fairiest college, <laughs> and uh, I think that just goes to show that they knew something about me that I wasn't quite ready to admit myself at that time. So. Anyway, that's a long-winded way of introducing this uh, brief ex excerpt from an essay in my book called The Fairiest College. I finally left the confines of suburbia, and after the now familiar four-hour car ride, I arrived at Amherst, but this time I was one of her own. I was already becoming someone else, a different person. The sun seemed a bit less out of reach. At the freshman orientation barbecue, my parents hovered over my shoulder, eagerly pointing out details in the scenery and in the architecture, or solicitously offering to get me more of the watered-down pink lemonade, all the time avoiding what was the inevitable goodbye. Huge fists of smoke from the grilling steaks curled and rose in the air, dramatically giving shape to the growing resentment that began to boil in my blood. I was too indignant about my own efforts at coolness being spoiled to acknowledge either the strain in my father's voice whenever he asked me a question, or the film of tears in my mother's eyes when she studied the cornice at the top of a pillar. My father had assigned himself the special responsibility of spotting potential friends for me in the crowd, which I found especially irritating because his criteria apparently were, one, that they be male, two, that they have short hair, and most important, three, that they have a Spanish-sounding surname. This third criterion required him to approach each prospective candidate quite closely while staring at his chest as he tried to make out the lettering on the scrawled name tags. Pathetic, I thought. Even as he had spurred me on to reach so high an echelon in American culture, still he searched for traces of his lost culture when I was glad to be rid of that somehow might root me. After about 20 minutes of this behavior, I told him plainly that he was embarrassing me and pleaded with him to stop. I desperately wanted to blend in. I was actually working at being nondescript. Just then he shouted, squinting, look over there, Jorge Arroyo, <laughs> enunciating the name clearly, rolling his R's beautifully, almost seductively. Now he looks like a nice guy. Why don't you go introduce yourself to him and find out whether he's in any of your pre-med classes? That was when I glimpsed the name tag myself, pinned to a colorful plaid shirt. As he walked by, his face turned towards an attractive woman who clung to his elbow. My father lunged to grab his shirt sleeve. I winced, yet he had not heard my father call out his name, and my father missed him by more than a few inches. When I had collected myself enough to speak, my voice was quietly and coolly irate. I stated I would not select my friends solely on the basis of their ethnicity or their pre-professional choices, that I wanted to form friendships on the basis of shared interests and not presuppositions, and that I would make a point of not meeting this Jorge Arroyo, and for that matter, any other Latinos or pre-meds, precisely because he wanted me to. 
Looking utterly crestfallen, my father trailed off to get us some more lemonade, drained all of his vicarious excitement, not knowing that years later he would be telling the same story gleefully, almost triumphantly, taking the credit for first identifying the man with whom I have spent most of my adult life. <laughs> That's a true story. If my dad were here, first of all, he'd be sitting right there in the front row. And then he would get up and say, oh, no, no, that's not how it happened. And this is the way it really happened. And anyway, you got my version of the story, which is actually the more accurate and <laughs> correct version. So um, and my twin nephews just started at Amherst College. So all the years of brainwashing paid off, I'm happy to say. So I really I'm, I'm, I don't want to go on too long because I know we want to have a, a conversation and, and uh, questions, but I also thought I had to read uh, a few poems from a sequence of poems called Ten Patients and Another because I'm here at a school of public health. And, and again, uh, when we talk about the social determinants of disease, I think sometimes we tend to get lost in the, in the, the sort of the statistics, the you know, faceless numbers in a sense. And, and, and one thing I want to leave you with to think about is how important narrative voices the voices of people living these disparities, these inequities, uh, are in our thinking about uh, how to best remedy them, how to best partner with uh, people in, in diverse communities to, to, solve, to solve these kinds of uh, challenges uh, with them. So I, I wanted to read a few poems from a, a, a sequence called 10 Patients and Another. And, and these were poems written uh, to try to elevate the voices of, of people uh, I have been privileged to care for uh, who have taught me so much about, about what we can sometimes, I think, perhaps more glibly think about as uh, uh, health disparities in, a, again, a kind of more abstract way. So this is from a sequence of poems called Ten Patients and Another. Mrs. G. The patient is a 60-odd-year-old white female who presents with fever, cough, and shaking chills. No further history could be elicited. She doesn't speak. The patient's social history was non-contributory. Someone left her here. The intern on the case heard crackles in both lungs. An EKG was done, which showed a heart was beating in the normal sinus rhythm, except for an occasional dropped beat. An intravenous line was placed. The intern found a bruise behind her ear. She then became quite agitated and began to sob without producing tears. We think she's dry. She's resting quietly on Haldol, waiting for her bed upstairs. Jamal. The patient is a three-year-old black male, the full-term product of a pregnancy that was, according to his grandmother, unplanned and may be complicated by prenatal alcohol exposure. Did okay, developmentally delayed but normal weights and heights until last week when he ingested what's turned out to be cocaine, according to the lab results. His grandmother had said she'd seen him with some baby powder on his face and hands before he started seizing and they brought him in. The vital signs have stabilized. The nurse is getting DSS involved. The mom, she left it on the kitchen table. That's her, the one who sings to him all night. Kelly, the patient is a 12-year-old white female. She's gravita zero, no STDs. She'd never even had a pelvic. One month nausea and vomiting. No change in bowel habits. No fever, chills, malaise. Her school performance has been worsening. She states that things at home are fine. On physical exam, she cried but was cooperative. Her abdomen was soft with normal bowel sounds in question of a suprapubic mass, which was non-tender. Her pelvic was remarkable for scars at 6 o'clock, no hymen visible, some uterine enlargement. Pregnancy tests positive times 2. She says it was her dad. He's sitting in the waiting room. Extending from her left ear down her jaw, the lack was seven centimeters long. 
She told me that she slipped and struck her face against the kitchen floor. The floor was wet because she had been mopping it. I guess she'd had to wait for many hours since the clock read nearly midnight. Who mops floors so late? Her little girl kept screaming in her husband's thick, impatient arms. He knocked three times, each time to ask when we'd be done. I infiltrated first with lidocaine. She barely winced and didn't start to cry until the 16th stitch went in and we were almost through. I thought my handiwork was admirable. I yawned, then offered her instructions on the care of wounds. She left. Manuel, in trauma one, a gay Latino kid, I think he's 17, is getting tubed for respiratory failure. Sleeping pills and Tylenol, I translated for him as he was wheeled in. His novio explained that when he told his folks about it all, they threw him out like trash. They lived together underneath the overpass of Highway 101 for seven weeks, the stars obstructed from their view. For cash, they sucked off older men in Cadillacs. A viejita from the neighborhood brought tacos to them secretly. Last night, with 18 wheelers roaring overhead, he whispered that he'd lost the will to live. He pawned his crucifix to get the pills. FP, another AIDS admission. This one's great. They bring him in strapped down because he threw his own infected shit at them. You better bring your goggles and a mask. We think he's got TB. He's pissed as hell. Apparently he wants to die at home, but somebody keeps calling 911. A relative back home in Iowa or some damn place. Just keep him snowed with Ativan. Believe you me, you do not want to get to know this fucker. Capacies all over, stinks like shit. Incontinent, of course. How long before you get down here? Because his nurse is driving me insane. Of course we got blood cultures. Yeah, a gas. Okay, I'll stick him one more time. The things you do for love. Maria. This G2 P1 gives us a confusing history. It sounds like she's been pregnant approximately 30 weeks, although she can't recall her LMP. No pain, but bleeding for about two days. Of course she hasn't had prenatal care, and God only knows where the father is. She works two jobs that keep her on her feet all day. She's been in the United States six months and doesn't speak a word of English. Bet you she's illegal. Cervical exam is unremarkable. The os is closed. I think we need an ultrasound to tell us more. Besides a look at her placenta, we need some confirmation of her dates. Her uterus can tell us more than she can. Jane Doe number two. They found her unresponsive in the street Beneath a lamplight, I imagined, made her seem angelic, regal even, clean. She must have been around 16. She died who knows how many hours earlier that day, the heroine inside her like a vengeful dream about to be fulfilled. Her hands were crossed about her chest as though raised up in self-defense. I tried to pry them open to confirm the absence of her heartbeat. But in death, she was so strong, as resolute as she was beautiful. I traced the track marks on her arms instead, then pressed my thumb against her bloodless lips. So urgent was my need to know. I felt the quiet left by a departing soul. I'm going to close by reading one more short excerpt from an essay and then one last poem, and then I promise we'll have plenty of time for questions and conversation. Um, I hope I've given you some sense of the connections between poetry and healing uh, that have informed uh, my work for, for some years now. Uh, so this is a couple of paragraphs that perhaps says it a little bit more uh, explicitly. 
uh, from an essay called AIDS and the Poetry of Healing. In poetry are present the fundamental beating contents of the body at peace, the regularity of resting brainwave activity in contrast to the disorganized spiking of a seizure, the gentle ebb and flow of breathing or sobbing in contrast to the harsh spasmodic cough, the single voiced ringing chant of a slogan at an act up rally in contrast to the indecipherable rumblings of AIDS funding debate on the Senate floor. The poem is a physical process, is bodily exercise. Rhymes become the mental resting places in the ascending rhythmic stairway of memory. The poem perhaps is an idealization or a dream of the physical, the imagined healthy form. Yet it does not renounce illness. Rather, it reinterprets it as the beginning point for healing. I wonder then whether poetry might also be therapeutic. Many of my friends, especially some of my colleagues in medicine, have teased me for believing in the curative power of words, joking that I should write some doggerel on my prescriptions instead of the names of medications and directions for their use. If poetry is made of breath or the beating heart, then surely it's not unreasonable to think it might reach those places in the bodies of its audience, however rarefied. Moreover, I joke back, I have never seen a poem cause fulminant liver failure or bone marrow toxicity, even a really bad one. <laughs> Putting the mouth to words and by incantation returning the regular rhythms to the working lungs, these were the principles by which ancient healers in Native American and indigenous cultures practiced their art. The Egyptians gave their dead a book full of charms and spells to be used in the afterlife. Might not poetry then facilitate the passing to another realm? Poetry is a pulsing, organized imagining of what once was, or is to be, what life once was, what life is to be. It is ampules of the purest, clearest drug of all, the essence and distillation of the process of living itself. I'm going to close with, uh, again, one last poem, and then, of course, I can read more if you want to hear more. Uh, I definitely want to hear your questions your comments, your uh, screams of outrage. Um, and uh, I thank you for your attention and your kindness and uh, hearing me share my work. And uh, thank you again for coming. Uh, this is, a, again, a last poem which has the, the word epidemiology in it, which there are not many poems with the word epidemiology in them. So I thought this would be appropriate. And I also want to read it for my husband who's here. It's his birthday today. He comes to all my readings. That's Jorge Arroyo. Thank you for coming. Happy birthday. I love you. What I would give. What I would like to give them for a change is not the usual prescription with its hubris of the power to restore, to cure, what I would like to give them, ill from not enough of lying in the sun, not caring what the onlookers might think while feeding some banana to their dogs. What I would like to offer them is this, not reassurance that their lungs sound fine or that the mole they've noticed change is not a melanoma, but instead of fear transfigured by some doctorly advice, I'd like to give them my astonishment at sudden rainfall like the whole world weeping and how ridiculously gently it slicked down my hair. I'd like to give them that, or the joy I felt while staring in your eyes as you learned epidemiology, the science of disease in populations, the night around our bed, like timelessness, like comfort, like what I would give to them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again. Hi, everyone. First, I'd like to say it's an absolute honor to sit up here with you today. As a lifelong book nerd, and for any of you other book nerds in the audience, to be able to sit up here and ask the author you the questions is pretty, um, I'm pinching myself. So I won't take up all the time so other book nerds can ask questions as well. 
Um, so as a queer public health professional who's had the privilege to work with um, many members of the BUSVH queer community, and when I say queer community, I am speaking inclusively with sexual orientation and gender identity. Some of those folks um, in the community are out to the world, some are not. Students, staff, faculty, on behalf of all of us, I'm truly grateful for your presence, for your presence in medicine, for your presence in literature, for your presence at Harvard's Teaching Hospital, in Boston, and for your presence here on campus. Your thank visibility you. really matters greatly to so many of us. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. Um, as we heard in the introduction, this is the first time that SPH has given the opportunity of choosing the SPH Reads book to a student organization, in this case, the Queer Alliance, and has given us such visibility in doing so. So thank you to Dean Galea and Dean Kozier. Um, in the, what I find so striking in the desire to heal and in your poetry is how your queerness is so central to your writing. Um, and it's not just a descriptor of your identity, but as the, the fullness of you and in desire, in eroticism, in joy, in fear. Um, and you said earlier in your session today with uh -huh. students that you don't often, we don't often read about erections. <laughs> um, and I would finish that statement with, you don't often read about erections assigned, uh, in books assigned to students by schools of public <laughs> health. So can you speak about bringing the fullness of your queerness al alive in your writing? Mm, yes, thank you for that question. It's, um, Yes, it's such a central aspect of who I am. And so, uh, and to be a healer, one has to be one's whole authentic self in that work, I think, to, to, do, it, uh, to do it effectively, to do it uh, truthfully, to do it in a way that's uh, meaningful for both me as, a, as, as an aspiring healer, but also uh, for the people I, I care for, for the people uh, who come to me for care. And so, so, and I think in particular because of the ways in which queer people are marginalized uh, in, in so many aspects of, of our lives, uh, it becomes all the more urgent to present myself fully and uh, openly and utterly honestly with all of my conflicts, with all of my desires, with all of my, uh, all of my foibles uh, uh, in a way that I, I hope uh, makes me uh, in some ways more humanly accessible uh, to people who perhaps uh, have experienced uh, homophobia, uh, rejection, uh, uh, sometimes even violence at the hands of, of the care system that is supposed to serve all of us. And so, so it's always been really important for me to, to be fully uh, visible, to be fully present in my work as a, as a doc. Uh, as well as uh, in, in other settings where I work with, with students and uh, in, in teaching settings, of course, I think uh, equally uh, important uh, for, for young aspiring queer healers to, to have role models. I, didn't, I, I felt I really didn't have that uh, when I went through my training. So, so, so those are uh, some of the reasons. And, and in terms of the experience of it, it's, it's, it's just so rewarding and gratifying to be able to connect with people through that uh, aspect of my identity uh, that really, I think, ultimately uh, humanizes me just as we all have aspects of ourselves that, that tell about our humanity. And, and these kinds of uh, so-called dis differences, I think, ultimately, uh, in our differences, we are actually, ironically, all the same. We all have aspects of ourselves that uh, are distinct. And, uh, and, and so, so we can, I, I think every single one of us has had an experience of, of difference uh, in, in one way or another. And so, so that can actually, ironically, become a point of, of commonality. And, and again, I think uh, that's, that's what I feel in, in, uh, in being uh, open about who I am and being true to who I am is, is simply, this is the work of being human and this is uh, who in some sense all of us are. And, uh, and, and to see that reflected back to me from, from uh, people I care for, my patients, who have uh, been through uh, so many uh, challenges and so many kinds of uh, uh, really uh, almost unimaginably difficult kinds of experiences uh, with pain, uh, 
uh, with uh, other kinds of uh, uh, challenges in terms of living their lives, it's, it's all the more, uh, again, uh, gratifying really to, to be able to share something of myself uh, with them uh, that, that brings us closer together. It's interesting when you were reading your first excerpt and talking, or the first poem, and it was um, when you said, when you talked about kissing your husband on the couch, I had such a visceral moment of being uncomfortable and then being so grateful it made me think of you know my own wife and, and that moment, that intimacy, and then realizing I want more of this in this um, professional setting. Like I'm, hung I'm hungry for it. And I think that vulnerability that you bring um, here in an academic setting to share so much of yourself as a healer and as a human being is so important. And I wonder what that, being that vulnerable in your own academic settings, mm -hmm. how, how that has impacted you personally and professionally. Yes, yes. Well, you know, I've certainly had colleagues say to me, I can't believe you write about that stuff. You know, like, oh my gosh, do your patients know that about you? And I'm like, well, I know a lot about them too. Um, <laughs> it doesn't seem like all that strange to me that they should know things about me that, that I routinely know about them. And so, um, so yes, there's a way in which that kind of um, vulnerability, I think, uh, I hope, uh, makes me more of a, of, of a fellow human being to, to, to all of my patients. And, and yes, sometimes it, it is uncomfortable and it is, uh, I, I'm sure many, many in this room again have had that experience of, of difference where you may feel you're like the only one in the room who uh, identifies in a particular way and, and how do we, you know, kind of navigate that in, in you know, professional settings. But, but on the other hand, I think, you know, again, particularly in medicine where, you know, we practice a kind of distancing that uh, I think potentially risks harming our, our patients when we are so removed from, from our patients that we, we cut off our empathetic uh, connections with them, uh, we actually risk giving less appropriate, less meaningful care. And, and that is, in my view, bad care. And so, so I think the trade-off of, uh, of feeling that kind of momentary discomfort at times uh, is is worth that tremendous benefit in, in in my in my experience, and then and then also the longer one does this, the longer one <laughs> becomes totally unabashed, and and you know th that's just you know I think people have come to expect <laughs> expect me to be that that person who says that thing and in the in the meeting where we're you know and 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 that's that's okay because uh, as you said I think we need to hear all of the perspectives that uh, that relate to a particular challenge or problem we're trying to solve, or uh, and it certainly could benefit us in the public health setting as well, because we need to be able to partner with our communities in, in doing the kind of work around prevention and around uh, helping communities to be healthier. Uh, we need to be part of those communities. We need to represent those communities. We need to hear the concerns expressed in, in their voices uh, and, and the priorities that they perceive need to be the ones that we uh, tackle together with them. So, so, so I think it's really, really uh, critically important that those aspects of who we are are visible to the communities we serve. It's interesting that your first reaction was that your colleagues had said, how could you be this vulnerable so your patients knew that much about you? I was wondering about your colleagues and yeah. your supervisors and the people professionally. So, yes, yes. so it's interesting that they were worried about that. Um, to go along your, your lines there about prevention and, and um, public health, I was struck by a line from one of your interviews recently um, where you said, to see identity translated into poor health is profoundly troubling and demands the empathetic response of the poem. And I wonder, I mean, it just, it speaks to so many of the things you've already read today. Um, and I wonder how kind of in this fraught world where we, we who drink the Kool-Aid, we who practice this every day, who know the language, who are talking um, about prevention, social determinants, how do you bring others, whether they're your peer, their family members, into the compassion that you have mm. and the stories and the identities that you see and that you experience both firsthand and with your patients mm. um, when they don't see it themselves? Yes, yes, that's really uh, a great question. And, and often it does involve bringing the arts and humanities into the space 
you know, spaces like these where, where we're not accustomed to hearing poems and, and, you know, and not my own poems. I don't inflict my own poems on, on people generally unless I'm invited to do so, which, uh, and again, you give a poet five minutes and I'll read for an hour as you just kind of experience. So, um, but yes, the, the poems and stories and narratives that come from communities that uh, are impacted by so-called uh, social determinants of disease or, or health inequities, health disparities, uh, are extraordinarily powerful and, and can totally change the conversation in, in the classroom when I'm teaching about health disparities and you know, uh, another slide with more statistics that are you know, depressing and make people feel helpless and make people feel frustrated and make people feel, feel angry, hopefully, and make people feel, um, but, but to share a poem by, by Denez Smith, for example, that, you know, that, that articulates that inequity, that, uh, that injustice in a way that is more viscerally accessible, again, transforms the kind of conversation we can have that, that and, I th and I had the sense in, in talking with people today throughout the day that, that, uh, that yeah, this is a, a worthwhile way to explore some of these ideas that we're, we're more typically addressing through you know, statistical analysis and through, and, and that's not to say the epidemiology isn't important, of course it is. We need those tools as well to, to help us describe, you know, the problems that we face as a, as a society, as a, as a, as a nation. Um, but I think juxtaposing those with the actual stories themselves uh, is even more compelling, is even more uh, powerful, and actually gives rise to some of the other kinds of feelings we need, like love, like hope, like we can change things. Uh, we need to feel inspired in that way. And sometimes, again, statistics can certainly piss us off. They make me angry and frustrated, but, but, um, but sometimes these voices actually inspire hope in us and inspire a sense of, I can, I can, I can do this work because someone else is, is, is doing this work and is living this this story, is living this life, is living this statistic. Um, so, so again, that empathetic uh, possibility through, through engaging, through poems, stories, other humanities, you know, art, dance, I mean, all of these things speak to us viscerally in a way that I think uh, can really empower us and, and, and again, give us, give us hope. Thank you. Um, Earlier, you noted that you couldn't imagine the work of healing without the arts and humanities, and that's been a central theme. I'm sure that you've had your fair share of naysayers on this topic, mm -hmm. um, but I'm actually interested in hearing where you found the kindred spirits along the way. Mm -hmm. um, so now that you're the editor of the poetry and medicine section of JAMA, you've definitely found a professional niche, but where, where did you find um, where did you find those kindred spirits, people who supported that art along the way, mm. um, and how did they propel you forward? Yes, well, I guess I would say probably first and foremost, again, my, my patients and you know, the, the, the stories uh, they have shared with me, the ways in which uh, they express what they are feeling, what they are living in just incredibly you know, imaginative, metaphoric language. I mean, I take care of many Latinos, and. You know, uh, I mean, you know, it's not just pain. It's a cold, bitter wind blowing through my liver. You know, these are, I mean, these are poems in 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 reality, in in real life, and uh, they're not invented. They're, and and that's um, uh, that's been incredibly sustaining to you know to really be able to hear those stories uh, as as truly stories and not just vehicles for data points. You know, and and. Um, so, so those those stories, so many of my patients have really sustained me in in in, in this way of thinking about uh, and knowing about uh, the experience of illness. And then I would say also, you know, a number of my writer friends over the years, you know, people who have, you know, very directly uh, engaged uh, poetry and other forms of uh, storytelling and narrative, uh, and I think who have lived better as a consequence. Uh, and have lived actually longer as a consequence of their writing about illness. I think of uh, my my friend, uh, the poet Marilyn Hacker, who 
has written about her experience of breast cancer. And when she was first diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, she already, and she's written about this, so um, uh, I think it's uh, okay to, to talk about uh, some of the details of her, of her uh, health uh, story uh, publicly, because again, she's, she's talked about it herself. But she had um, already uh, metastatic uh, breast cancer and was told by her docs she had you know, maybe you know, a few more years to live. And she's, she's continued you know, now 10 years out from her diagnosis and is still writing about her, her, her cancer and, and, and has empowered so many others to, uh, to write about cancer from the perspective, uh, as it happens, of a, of a queer woman. Uh, and so, so, so I think you know, those, those stories also uh, those people uh, have been real touchstones for me and have really uh, sustained me. One of my uh, dearest mentors in college who I wrote about in, in my memoir, uh, Eve Sedgwick, similarly was diagnosed with, with breast cancer. She, she was uh, uh, really one of the um, founders of the whole queer theory uh, discipline. And, and uh, her writing, uh, both as a critic but also as a poet herself about about her experiences with cancer, I think similarly sustained her. And, and again, the kind of courage and the kind of empowerment that her writing uh, demonstrates, I think is, is also sustaining for me. All right, at this moment, I'd like to open it up um, to questions or comments from folks who are here. I see a hand in the back. Is there a microphone? Yeah, the microphone's coming. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us. Um, I'd like to ask. Um, I'm very. It's very impressive how open you are about your experiences and how you articulate them while you're sharing them. I. How do you mitigate a, um, against litigations from your clients, from your clients and your patients, mm -hmm. especially sometimes as you use the exact words? That they used, and you describe in details mm. your uh, relationships and interactions with them. Yes. So how that's do you a do really that? important question to think about always in anyone who is writing about experiences, shared experiences with uh, people uh, living with illness. Uh, how how can we represent? Do, do we want to repeat the question, Julia, or did everyone hear the question? Yeah. So you know, it's a really uh, again. A, extraordinarily important uh, ethical concern, and also uh, an aesthetic and, and uh, uh, I think a concern also, you know, kind of more from even a writerly standpoint. And so, so uh, the way I always think about it, and again, we could probably have, you know, a, a whole, you know, three-day seminar on, on this, this one question. Uh, it's, it's that important. Um, I think w w one way I, I, I think about it is always first to examine uh, my own sort of agency, my own uh, uh, power, my own uh, stance in relation to the story that I want to tell and uh, what presumptions uh, I, I bring to telling the story. Who am I even to, to, to want to tell this story? And so, uh, so bringing to that uh, writing and to that process uh, a, a very deep sense of humility and uh, a sense of also, really, who, whose story is this? Uh, that, that's critically important. Just posing those questions to oneself, uh, I think, can safeguard one from, from uh, taking liberties or, or, or distorting stories in a way that perhaps in some ways could be self-serving or, or disempowering to, to the other person or other people who are part of that story. At the same time, I think it's also like just extraordinarily important for us to recognize our own complicity in these stories, that, that uh, I was a participant in some of these stories, and, and I, I own them myself in many, in many ways. And I think that's particularly important to acknowledge when I made a mistake or when I behaved in a way that I, I feel, looking back on it, uh, was shameful or was, was wrong. And so, so that's another way I feel uh, I'm I'm honoring these stories in a way that, that doesn't, um, uh, again, sort of aggrandize me or make me the hero of the story or, or make medicine the hero of the story. No, it's, I wanna present these stories uh, 
um, I'm not entirely in a doc documentary fashion, but in a way that, that really represents, uh, as best I can, uh, my own defects and my own, uh, the, the kind of challenges that I faced in, in trying to uh, uh, navigate some of these, these kinds of situations. And so, so I think that's important too, to, to uh, think about, think really critically about how one represents oneself in, in these kinds of stories. Uh, so that's another thing. And then of course another uh, important point is to always ask permission when possible. Um, I think that's probably the best way to, to again, mitigate uh, some of the kinds of concerns around you know, whose story this is. And I, I, whenever I can, I, I ask permission. I will share what I've written with the, the person who's in the story or the people who are in the story. Uh, or in the poem, and uh, and and even more than that, co-write, collaborate. You know, these are again shared stories. The way I see them, they're they're shared. They don't necessarily belong to me. I think they belong to all of us who are participants, uh, all of us who are present. And then, in a really important sense, they belong to all of us. And so that's another uh, perhaps uh, uh, important motivation to think of is that uh, why I'm telling the stories. Uh, is because it it's, helps all of us. It, it's, it, there's a, a beneficence uh, component, if you will, that, um, that I think is, again, uh, central to, to what I'm trying to put out in my work. I don't wanna ever really um, uh, present these as sort of sensationalistic or, uh, yeah, so, so, but these are all really important questions and I'd be curious what others have to, say about these issues, because they are, uh, again, r absolutely critically important questions, if others have thoughts about it. Yes? Oh, that's fine, too. Thank you. I thank you so much. I want to especially thank you for your book, which I, I know it's been around a while. I'm so glad to discover it. Thank you. And just started reading it and immediately was so deeply moved by how Thank much you. desire, and desire for connection is at the heart of it. Yes. Thank um, you. So I have two questions I'm going to merge together. So in public health, we're all often more distant than the patient-doctor relationship. Some community work, of course, is, is quite connected to people with their stories. So. First question is, what um, guidance might you give us in public health to make narrative and people's, that connection to people's stories central, along with our data points? Mm -hmm. That's a big one. You can pick one or two of these. <laughs> the other one is more about medicine. How can we keep patient stories um, in the medical record? Mm. And by that, I mean, yes, electronically, but they're so full of important yes. information that needs to be passed on, yes. in my field, in women's health, passed on yes. a birth story to yes. the providers in the future. Yes. Two no. big questions, pick Two one. Two big questions. Well, maybe I'll, I'll start with the second one and, and uh, because that, that one I perhaps can speak to more directly from seeing examples of how patient stories are actually integrated into the medical record. And you know, I think what we do often in medicine, uh, unfortunately, and, and this help happens, I think, to some extent also in public health, is, is we appropriate the stories and then we translate them into our languages of either epidemiology or, or medical ease. Um, uh, and then uh, by doing so, actually uh, take control of the, the narrative. And our narrative, our story becomes the important one. That's the one that gets written in the chart. That's the one that gets published in you know, the, uh, the prestigious journal. And, and the patient story is, is, is lost. And actually, as you suggest, I think, it's the patient stories that are really most critical uh, for us, in, uh, particularly in de delivering care to individual patients, uh, especially so in, in that, uh, in that um, care relationship. And so, some of the ways I've seen it done is uh, through uh, a project that's actually being uh, piloted here at the Boston uh, VA hospital by a colleague, uh, Dr. Susan Nathan, who is asking uh, veterans to uh, write down their stories or tell their stories and she or others in her uh, group transcribe them. And then those 
stories that they tell about their lives, about their health, go in the very front of the chart. So anyone looking at the medical record is sees first and, first and foremost that patient's story. Whatever that patient's story uh, was that uh, in his or her mind was, was most important to, to share with the care team. So, so that's one, one example uh, where I work at Beth Israel Deacons Medical Center in Boston. Um, some of my colleagues are pioneering uh, something called Open Notes, which is uh, a, a, a place where patients actually write in the medical record. They, they can read all of our notes, which I think is fantastic. They can access anything that I put in the medical record online and, and, and then send me an email or, or write me a letter. I prefer it if they write me a letter, honestly, but, but they can email me um, saying, hey, you know, doc, you got this wrong. That's not what I said. Or, hey, this is actually what was really important to me in the visit. And those, that kind of dialogue is absolutely invaluable to me because I learned things that Somehow, and I think of myself as being pretty, you know, I'm, I'm trying to listen pretty attentively. I mean, I'm a poet, for God's sake. And, and I miss things, like any of us do, because I, I will get focused on my, you know, well, your potassium was, you know, the, that's absolutely, I, I think, just utterly invaluable to have those, that, that kind of dialogue with patients over, longitudinally uh, over time, not just in the, you know, clinical encounter. So those, so those are a couple of examples where the patient's voice, the patient's uh, story uh, is being heard much more clearly, much more explicitly in, in, the, in the medical record, so. Hugely helpful, thank yes, you. Yes, yes, thank you. Other questions or comments? Got a few more minutes. I confess I haven't read your book yet, and now I will definitely have to do it, plus your <laughs> other books. <clears throat> Thank uh, you. And maybe it's already in the introductions there, uh, but just wondering, how did you get into poetry? Did it precede getting into medicine? Uh, did it change when you got your focus, mm. your medical focus? Um, do you write other kinds of poetry as well? <laughs> sure, no, those are great questions, thank you. Um, I guess I would say first uh, that, that poetry was always uh, part of my life and uh, beginning very early on and uh, being the child of immigrants, uh, my parents, uh, as much as they wanted me and my siblings to assimilate uh, and to be American, uh, they exposed us to poetry as a way of also kind of uh, holding on to an aspect of, of our cultural identity, our, our Cuban identity, that um, for me was also a way of healing this kind of fracture of, of losing our homeland in some sense. And, and, and so, yeah, poetry always seemed like a way of, of repairing that, that wound, which uh, unfortunately uh, many in, in the Cuban American community, I think, still, still feel very acutely. And so, um, so, so I had that notion from an early age that, that poetry uh, was, was indeed healing. And then uh, I went on to uh, a small liberal arts college, Amherst College, as I mentioned, uh, which also presented uh, the liberal arts poetry, of course, uh, as part of that, the humanities, um, as really an equally important uh, way of knowing about the world as was science and and seeing those two uh, ways of knowing uh, really juxtaposed with one another and and presented as again sort of equally important equally valuable um, kind of affirmed that notion for me that that yes of course poetry is important and uh, and and so uh, and could be joined with medicine of course then I got to Harvard Medical School as I said and and th that kind of broke down I was at a big research university where suddenly. Poetry was like poetry. What, what do you mean? What do you mean poetry? That's like that's scary. And why are you doing that? Stop it. Um, and so, so there was a challenge there. But you know, again, uh, as I was describing before, hearing the poetry and what my patients tell me every day made me realize that actually these two things are inextricably interrelated. And and again, there the the science and 
the, the technology in medicine is, is just another way we have of knowing about human experience and another way we have of understanding our bodies, but it's no more important uh, or more useful than, than the way poetry, art, dance helps us understand who we are and how we experience pain, how we experience suffering, how, we, how our bodies work. I mean, those are, again, to me, parallel ways of, of, of knowing ourselves um, and knowing the human condition. And in fact, you know, I, I really resist the notion that you know, science can explain everything. I don't want to live in a world where you know, everything is explicated by, you know, I don't know, the, we, we're decoding the genome. And I don't, want to, I don't want to live in that world. I want to feel mystery. I want to feel, you know, just I want to look at a painting and feel awe and be moved. I don't necessarily want it to explain who I am in the world. I want to just let it help me feel who I am in the world. So, so I think, um, yeah, I think they're, they're complementary and neither is more important. And I was, I think, just fortunate to be uh, this kind of, I don't know, unusual combination of identities that helped me to sort of realize that, wow, poetry actually helps me in some ways more to you know, repair some of those uh, fractures, if you will, than, than all the medicine I learned you know, at wonderful places like Harvard Medical School. So, so you, but so you were writing poetry also at an early age. Yes, yes, I started college, writing you know? early. You know, very presumptuously, like I could write poetry, um, mm -hmm. but I, I certainly tried. And um, and then I had more formal training in, in writing poetry when I was at at Amherst. I was very lucky to work with uh, a couple of poets there who are visiting writers and. Um, and then went on, actually I took a year off between my third and fourth year of medical school because I, I, I thought, oh my God, I made a terrible mistake. I'm, this is not what I thought it was gonna be. I thought we were gonna be talking about, you know, things like, you know, the end of life and the nature of suffering and, you know, these kind of larger human questions and I, I, that's how naive I was. It was really almost entirely, you know, pathophysiology, anatomy, all the, all the hard science and very little, in fact, almost nothing at all around even the social determinants of disease, some of the things that we've been talking about here, it was very, very uh, biomedically oriented. Uh, my training was anyway, so it's starting to change a little bit. Um, but um, yeah, so so. Uh, Thank you. I have time for one question. One more question. Hi. 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 Um, so I have a question, and I think it, it's an extension of the commentary you were making regarding. Um, the narratives that your colleagues are now collecting in several mm. hospitals and institutions that detail more qualitative assessment yeah. of, a, of a patient, which I think is beautiful. My question is, and I think also from my experience working with hospitals and institutions who do a lot of research that goes into the community and also takes from the community, what power do you feel like doctors have in bridging the funding that's coming into hospitals mm. by the NIH the NIDA, all these other big powerhouse institutions, yeah. to actually bridge that quantitative, very heavy, prioritized, and heavily funded piece yes, yeah. into more qualitative spaces. Yeah. Like, where do you see that going in the future? How do you see doctors playing a role? Um, and how do you see that transforming? Yes, that's a great question. And we certainly, uh, it goes without saying that we need more of those resources going into uh, qualitative uh, kinds of assessments and really, again, uh, supporting the kinds of partnerships that can really make for meaningful change in relation to uh, uh, social determinants of disease and, and health equity and, and uh, yes, absolutely. And, and I think doctors really do have a very important role to play in that. And uh, I think perhaps the future of that has to do with who we attract to medical school in some sense. You know, and it's been really heartening for me to see how, how the presence of more people of color, more women, more queer people in medicine has really begun to uh, change the kinds of questions that are being asked and the kinds of grants that are being written. And so just having those perspectives represented in medicine is part of how doctors, I think, can begin to redirect you know, some of that funding into areas uh, where I think it could have uh, much more impact. I think also, you know, how we ourselves in, in medicine uh, present our data. Uh, and I was just talking earlier with uh, folks here who are really thinking, you know, so creatively about, you know, when we report 
data in you know, these prestigious scientific journals. We could also present alongside those data other ways of knowing about the same information that uh, perhaps comes from, again, narrative, that comes from qualitative analysis, that comes from uh, inviting people from communities to be in that space together with us. And so uh, in this new role I have at JAMA, we're exploring how can we take what's been a, a wonderful you know, sort of small section of the journal, Poetry and Medicine, that honestly in some ways has felt like kind of window dressing or kind of like, oh, there's a nice little poem there, and, but it's not really what, what JAMA's about. We're thinking really broadly about how can we leverage what we're publishing in terms of poetry uh, to, to make the science that we publish uh, more meaningful and more accessible to uh, broader audiences. And so, so there is really opportunity even in those spaces. And, and I am thrilled that, that my fellow editors at JAMA are really open to exploring what we can do in, in that kind of a partnership. Um, and so, so getting into those spaces, but then also creating our own spaces for sharing uh, the kinds of uh, information, the kinds of, uh, again, more experiential, more qualitative research. Uh, we, can, we can get that information out there in podcasts, in online journals, and, and, uh, and that can be done very, I think, uh, democratically as well. So we don't have to use those kinds of outlets, but, but you know, I was hearing about uh, an online uh, resource here where, again, uh, these kinds of questions are being addressed uh, in, in narrative, in story form, and in, in other ways, you know, of of uh, in, uh, investigating these kinds of concerns. So, so that's really exciting, and it's happening right here at BU School of Public Health. So congratulations on that, that's awesome. So Thank thanks, you. that's a great question. Thank you, but as, as I wrap up, I just wanted to um, bring up one more quick point that I forgot to mention in our topic of queerness. When you read that story um, about, is it Aurora? Aurora, yeah. Oh, yeah, Aurora. And then in the book as well, you refer to her as transsexual, yes. and that is a term that the community no longer exactly. uses, so I want to make sure the audience is yes. aware that this, yes, this that, is that a, was a dated term. That was a dated term, and yeah. also uh, to be aware too that that was actually a term that was, was used then, uh, I would say, uh, actually pejoratively, and one of the reasons why our community now rejects it. Um, so yes. so that's important. Yeah. Gender yes, non -conforming. exactly. That's really important. Yeah. I, sh I should yes. have mentioned that, but that's thank absolutely you. true, yes. Thank you. So I just want to um, thank you so much for your time. Can we have a round of applause? Thank you Rafael all for coming. Campo? Thank you, really, thank you. for spending the day and for sharing all yeah. of your your art with us. Thank and, you for um, having me. Uh, Dean Kozier would like me to announce that we can continue this conversation. Anyone who would like to continue the conversation, tomorrow there's going to be an opportunity from 12 to 1 in Talbot 311 East um, with Dr. Sherry Johnson, who's the Director of Organizational Development and Training in the Office of BU's Provost of Diversity and Inclusion. She's coming here on campus. Um, all are welcome, again, from 12 to 1 in Talbot 311 with Dr. Sherry Johnson and bring your own lunch. Lunch is not provided, <laughs> um, but it's open to anyone. And again, one final, and will you be able to stay for a few moments to talk to people? So anybody who would like to speak to Dr. Campo is welcome to stay, but one more round of applause. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>